Welcome. Check one, two. Check one, two. Awesome. Perfect. Well, welcome to the Enrich Life podcast. And uh, this is a new format that we're going to be doing for the uh, time being for the COVID 19 podcast. Uh, isolation and response and we're just doing this because uh, we won't we still want to record one episode a week and we do have a couple of guests uh, we have uh, coming back on f- over the next couple of weeks we hopefully have a guest that's going to come on and talk about interfaith and what it looks like to uh, in- mingle with people from another faith another background and how we can meet in the middle uh, we also have Maddie Foster who's going to come back on and we're going to go deeper into our relationship discussion when we just talked about uh, companionship and we talked about marriage in episode 15. And so in this episode, we actually want to talk, unpack the other area of relationship when it comes to community and exactly how that looks, especially in a time like this. So we're going to be doing it live. Uh, we don't expect, you know, it is at 10 a.m. So we want to start the day off. Uh, our goal is is for you to start our, start your day off with us, and then this recording will go on YouTube and it'll go on our podcast format. Uh, it'll go on Spotify. It'll go on uh, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and other major podcasting sites that you may have. So uh, you can also interact with our podcast episode after it's live. So. We're just going to be doing this once a week and Fridays at 10 a.m. And you can text your questions at the uh, phone number on the screen there. You can also email us at enrichuregina at outlook.com if you have any questions. And you can also go to our website, www.enrichregina.com. And you can also message us your questions there as well. So we want to start interacting with you. We want you to... Uh, engage in chats and we also are on Facebook chat or Facebook live too so I'm actually currently on the Facebook chat right now so if you have any questions uh, that you want to put on the chat too regarding the topic that we're doing for today or anything regarding our previous topics you can also put it in the chat so uh, we just are going to start off with our first segment. That's our house cleaning. Uh, for Enrich U of R, uh, campus is all online now. So we are actually not convening any Enrich U of R events in person. Uh, what we are doing is we're going to do these po- live podcasts once a week at 10 a.m. We're also combining Enrich U of R with our the youth group or the young adult group that I at the church that I work at as the kids pastor at Avonhurst Pentecostal Assembly. So if you go to our Enrich U of R Facebook page and our Instagram, we actually shared the collective young or the Avonhurst Young Adults. Uh, we shared their calendar and we're actually going to be combining those events together on uh, Facebook Live format and on Zoom. And uh, you can get the Zoom link on our website uh, for those events. Next Thursday night at 7 p.m., we are going to be doing Jackbox games and a introduction, reintroduction into the uh into the Bible study they've been doing. And we're actually going to do a screen share of the Bible study. So we're all going to watch it together in person. And then we're going to discuss what uh, we just watched. So it's a it's a study that Louis G- Gigolo does on uh, Colossians. It's a very good study. It's on Right Now Media. And so we want to encourage you to participate in that on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. starting next Thursday. That's the Thursday before Good Friday. And then the week after that, we're doing a full-on Bible study within Colossians on the next episode. And then the week after that, we are actually going to be doing a worship night where uh, Caleb is leading the Young Adult Band in an acoustic set. And we're going to do live worship right on Facebook live and on zoom and we're, then we're going to end i think with another bible study and probably more games so pastor jacob miller is actually going to be leading that uh with myself as well and so that'll be a lot of fun and we'll all be on that call so it'll give you another opportunity to connect to a community and to be a part of something even though we're all isolated at home so we're just going to get started with our first segment today uh things i love and things i hate and so the first thing I wanted to talk about is the things I love. So uh, because we've been isolated, I've been trying not to go into the church to work at, at the church. And of course, I'm not at, on campus. Uh, our Red, Red Frogs has been 
postponed and canceled for the year because there's no events to do red frogs at and uh, we should all actually be respecting the social social distancing measures and so if you're having a hard time doing that or you are not doing that i want to encourage you to actually you know it is government mandated it is something that we are supposed to be doing and uh, we just had a new uh, case come out out of the golden mile superstore it was on regina ctv news so uh it is out there, and I think I think some people probably have it without even knowing it because it is a the case is is that this COVID nineteen actually doesn't really it, if the the most vulnerable are those who are in the older demographic, but even though you get it and you're younger and you can fight it off, and if you are pretty healthy, you you probably will fight it off. That's what everyone is saying. But even if you do that, you are be you do become a carrier of it, and it's very contagious. So we all have a role to play in this time to just stay at home as much as you can, work from home if you can, if you have to. And uh, I think we should all really respect the social distancing measures. And we're creating all these opportunities for you to connect online with us so that you have an outlet, so that you have somewhere to go uh, if you have any questions or need help, if you need groceries or if you need anything like that. We are still, uh, in Rich Uvar is still giving out our hampers and we have actually given out 10 hampers. So two of them actually, we've kind of turned into a delivery service because the last two hampers, the people actually paid for their stuff and they cover the cost. So uh We've kind of turned into a delivery service for students that are stranded and can't get to the store. So please uh, email us at enrichuregina at outlook.com if you need help, because uh, we would love to help you and bring you some supplies and some groceries. So, but, um, so the things, things I love. So since we're social distancing, since we're staying isolated at home, I've actually been, uh, you know, I have had a lot of work to do from home and, but uh, it's also been nice to spend time with family and to spend time with my daughter, but, uh, it's also been uh, a lot of fun to watch, you know, a bit more TV, a bit more movies or play games than I usually would. And actually we just watched it with our downstairs tenant on Tuesday night. We watched uh, Mad Max Fury Road, which I haven't seen in a long time. And I've always said it's one of my favorite movies to come out in the last decade it's very good and i upon re-watching it i actually uh really love that movie it's it's now it's funny because i have recommended it to people some people have watched it and a lot of people it's a very divisive movie there's a lot of people that don't like mad max fury road uh it's just it's a it's i think it's actually the best action movie ever made it's so the action is so tight in it uh the directing is so tight every single action scene you know exactly exactly going on you can see the uh clear intention of the director it's really hard to uh i don't think people realize how hard it is to film action and and to keep everything contained and focused but mad max free road feels very focused it doesn't feel chaotic in its action and it is i think it's the best action movie ever made it's just so good the, there's one action set piece at the beginning of the movie uh that usually is at the end of most action movies and it, the movie starts out like that it's just high octane uh the story is is there it's very minimal i l also love that movie because there's not a lot of dialogue and it uses filmmaking it uses movie making to actually tell the story a lot like gravity did so gravity a lot of people would be like nothing really happens in gravity and a lot of people might say that about mad max free road but uh the 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 way it's shot is telling the story so you know there's actually themes of um abuse of power there's themes of kind of political tyranny there's also themes of what uh, a cult or an unchecked religion can look like uh in and how someone can take advantage of that so there's all these themes there's also themes of how we treat the environment and how we're we supposed to take care of the environment instead of just uh kind of pillaging it it's like we do sometimes so it's a very good movie it's a very loaded movie it's a very fun movie to watch tom hardy's awesome charlie theron is awesome as furiosa in it and i'd really recommend watching mad max fury road uh, there are some suggestive things in the movie, just so you are aware of. Uh, just there's a lot of violence, a lot of action, and there is some. It is a very weird movie. It's a post-apocalyptic movie, and it's a very like George Miller wrote and directed it, and he knows exactly what his world looks like. So they call gasoline guzzoline, and they call uh, they have very specific language, and they have. Uh, there's a scene in the movie where. 
Uh, the cult is living off of these women who are giving their milk to the cult. It's called Mother's Milk. So there is some, a lot of people think it's really weird. I really love the creativity of it. I think it's very interesting to see, you know, like that may be how society would function, especially if you didn't have access to water, if you didn't have access to the things you need. So what would, you know, how would it look? And I think it's a very far-fetched view of the future. I don't think it's actually what is... I don't think the filmmakers are predicting anything with it, but I do think it's an interesting concept and it's very creative and it's just, it has the best action I've seen in a movie in a very long time, if not ever. So it's just very good. It knows what it is. It's high octane, high action. The whole movie's a car chase pretty much, uh, but then they litter these awesome moments into the movie with awesome characters. And so I do recommend watching Mad Max Free Road. Another thing that I love is, and I've been re-watching this series, and if you have any interest in politics, if you have any interest in anything regarding uh, what it's like to be a leader of a nation or a leader in general, I would recommend watching House of Cards. It's on Netflix, and the series is done. The last season, season six, uh, is not very good. Uh, it's I still don't mind it because... You know, I do love the show, but the earlier seasons are just fantastic. It does get a little bit far-fetched at times with, you know, some of the plot twists and stuff like that. But uh, the show is just about a uh, someone, uh, he starts out as a congressional whip and his name is Francis Underwood. And he works his way up in, his goal is to work his way up into the White House. And he does it by any means necessary. And it's all about abuse of power, government corruption, what it takes to actually get somewhere in life when it comes to being competitive and and the game of politics that's what it's about it's about playing the game of politics it's a very uh, dark show it's not it's very cynical uh you know it's it's it might be a slog for some to watch because it's very dialogue heavy but david fincher actually became the showrunner of the first three seasons and he directed the first couple of episodes and wrote i think the first season or co-wrote it so david fincher's fingerprints are on it and if you don't know who david fincher is he's the uh, man who did fight club he did seven he did the social network he's done gone girl uh he is an amazing filmmaker he's done the zodiac or zodiac it's called uh so i really recommend uh watching house of cards it does have the david fincher dialogue heavy feel to it and uh it's if you have any interest in politics or any interest in just it's almost like game of thrones where it's like what does it take to become a leader what does it take to lead the nation uh and all means necessary kind of thing so i do recommend watching that now things i hate and we're this is gonna this is gonna transition us from uh this segment into our main body segment when we are talking about the next step in our relationships and that is what is it mean to have a community what why is it actually biblical to have a community is it actually important uh why do we always talk about community and and what is the function and the role of community that's what we're going to be talking about today uh when it comes to so we're taking we started relationships with companionship and with this marriage and this idea of romantic kind of a romantic relationship or even a friendship and how a friendship can lead into that and why you need a friendship first but we're actually going to expand on that and go beyond kind of the one-on-one relationships and we're going to talk about what it means to be in community and that's what we're unpacking today especially you know we i wanted to talk about this in light of our situation when we're social distancing but the thing i hate is the mixed messaging and the missed messaging and the misreporting on what is going on with COVID-19. So uh, I actually want to bring up an article that I found on the National Post. And the National Post does lean conservative at times. I think it actually does a good job of being in the middle. Uh, It does a good job of kind of almost being, you know, they they have a few writers on there that kind of lean both ways or that kind of stay in the middle in a lot of ways. And they just released a really good article and in our write-up for the podcast, we're actually going to link this article in our on the YouTube section uh, if you want to go see it. But it's on the National Post, and the article is titled, uh, Canada's Public Data on COVID-19 is Mostly a Mess. Here's how to find the useful info. So this article is very good. It kind of highlights exactly what is going on with the misreporting. 
And so this is what this is an excerpt from the article that I want to read. The problem is that much of it's based on public data that is and that these are the studies on COVID-19 that we are seeing every single day pop up in different media sources, both on both on the right and the left. The problem is that much of it it's based on public data that's limited, incomplete and often outdated, meaning it can lead to wrong conclusions about what's really happening. It's not all bad news. Public health agencies are slowly improving at providing detailed and up-to-date information. Testing backlogs, backlogs are starting to clear and lab capacity is rising, but it remains very difficult to find detailed sources of data and accurately compare jurisdictions in, and most charts should still be viewed with a skeptical eye. Okay, so this is what it's talking about. It's when you go on a news source or you read a news article, and I don't know if you've seen anything with graphs these days or you see a lot of graphs and the graphs will spike. They'll go, they'll start really low and then they'll go whoop, but the thing about those graphs that we that you know I was talking uh, to a couple of people about this this week. The thing about those graphs I don't like is that uh, you, you know a lot of people just see the 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 curve go up, right? And they get kind of really scared or nervous because it looks like coronavirus is just spreading and spreading and spreading and expanding so fast and we can't control it. But we don't look at the side numbers. We don't look at exactly you know that uh, we don't look exactly at the time frame. We don't look at even the numbers on the side that have the uh, they usually tell how many people are infected. So we don't actually consider the jump between the numbers. Usually the jump is like five or it's under 10. So it's pretty minimal. And that's why you see that thing skyrocket. It's not like it goes from zero to 30 to 60. It goes from like zero to five to 10 to 15 to 20. And that's why you're getting such a large curve. So you know what that graph what those graphs might be showing is that hey there might be seven new cases right and then that would cause the graph to spike so that's what this national post article is saying so this is what it says here's a guide to the known problems with our data right now and this is how to sort through the mess to find what's truly useful most of the charts you see are based on confirmed case counts, which are tests for COVID-19, complete, completed by a qualified lab. But these case counts present a very limited picture of a country situation, and sometimes a highly distorted one. Case counts are always about two weeks behind due to the lag in people developing symptoms and getting tested. They also substantially underestimate the real case count due to the limited testing capacity. But Canada's case count is partic particularly tough to analyze because of differences in how provinces test BC and Alberta, for example, started out testing widely and then tightened their criteria to high priority cases. Ontario and Quebec are the opposite. They started out slowly and now are testing more quickly and widely, though Quebec ramped up much faster. Furthermore, beware of misleading spikes in daily case counts. They tend to be due to backlogs being cleared or a change in how tests are processed, not a real daily increase in cases. So for all these reasons, case counts must be treated as just one indicator of a country situation. Hospitalizations and deaths are more reliable metrics though both of these also come with caveats. So this is just an excerpt from the article and I wanted to read that part of the article. And again, if you're just joining us live, you can write a question on Facebook Live or you can text your questions to that number down below. And I'm just gonna open the chat here again. I'm gonna refresh it just in case I missed any questions. So you know what, uh, I wanted to read that excerpt from the article because I just want it to be an encouragement because the thing I hate is that there's so many, the media, uh, especially the if you read United States media, there's a lot of media that just wants to hit Trump really hard with this virus. There's uh, even a lot of our media in Canada want to hit Trudeau really hard with it on the right. And I think we have to realize that we have to be very careful with what we're reading when it comes to COVID-19. So uh, if you're not willing, I mean, I would even say don't kind of limit your news articles per day, limit your social media interaction per day when it comes to uh, the news and this COVID-19. And the, the the real measure is, is that we had, I think, eight new cases here in Saskatchewan yesterday. And most of the key cases in Saskatchewan are actually being treated. Uh, there's only about four cases in the hospital right now. And so this virus, I mean, it's spreading, but in Saskatchewan, we're actually doing a good job of social distancing. And uh, we're actually, it's not spreading as fast as other provinces. So 
that's that should be an encouragement for everyone. I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to put that link to the National Post article. And I want you all to read it because I think it's a very interesting article to read just to understand the data you're taking in and how to read it and how to process it. Because the thing I hate is how the media is misleading a lot of us and the media is kind of creating fear mongering among this virus. And I'm not saying this virus isn't important. Uh, the virus is very real. It's very contagious. Uh, the death rate in the United States has gone up a little bit. It's 1.2% right now. I think the death rate in Italy has gone from 10% and it has gone down to about 6%. Uh, and the reason why Italy was hit so hard, just because of demographics, they're an older nation. They are a bit more unhealthy than North America where they drink a lot more. They smoke a lot more. They also have families that live together a lot more in Italy. So it's just a kind of a lot of factors leading up to that. So I want that to be an encouragement for you today. And uh, I, I want you to read that article just to understand how to read the data. I'm not saying stop reading the news at all, because I think it is important to kind of catch up on what's going on, especially since we should be all at home. Uh, so I think it's, and I, I, I just don't think it's as scary as a, a lot of media sources are saying that it is. And that being said, we shouldn't go out and just disrespect this uh this emergency that we're in we should respect it we should listen to our government we should stay at home as much as we can and we have these awesome tools online and on the internet to actually interact with each other and we can still get that i know it's not the same as being in person but it, we can still see each other's faces and we can still connect so i want that to be encouraging for all of us today now that's going to tie in into our topic for today and you know with what is community and I think we throw that word around quite a bit, especially at church when it comes to community. I know on our website, uh, you know, our three tenets for Enrich U of R are uh, discipleship, faith, and justice. And all three of those actually tie into community. That's why we picked those three vision tenets and those three pillars. And that's what our group stands for at the University of Regina. And all three of those tie into community in different ways, right? Uh, faith and trust in God and in each other is very important. Justice, doing justice together and helping people as a group and as individuals uh, and binding together to do something together is very important as well. And that's what we've been doing with Red Frogs and that's why that has been so important. Uh, and then also discipleship. Discipleship cannot happen if you don't have a community and you don't have that support. And you can't actually grow in your faith without people pushing you, without people coming into your life and holding you accountable. Now, what does the Bible have to say about community? We say it all the time at church that it's all about community and it's so important. And now in this time, in this internet age, we have actually been separated in person. It is actually, you know, we haven't had Sunday morning church in a long time. We have had to do live church online. We've had to do it on YouTube. And so it, for me, especially last week, it's actually forced me to really think about, you know, what's the role of ministry and what's the role of church? And Alyssa Flamin just logged on is watching. Hello, Alyssa, on Facebook Live. And so now I want us to unpack that today. And we, we're actually going to stick right to Scripture, and we're, get, we're going to unpack it biblically. Because I think a lot of times you hear sound bites from pastors or from leaders. You hear sound bites even from politicians when it comes to how we are supposed to be a part of a community. And I think sometimes it just might be a word that we use and we throw around and we actually don't know why it's so important. I think that's might be where a lot of even pastors or leaders are at right now when they're forced to pivot and work extra hard to edit videos and do this online stuff and to get better at it. So uh, I think it's really important to actually start to, because I think it's, I personally think, and I know that community is more than just meeting on a Sunday morning together. It's more than just worship, having a worship experience together. Uh, community is much more than that. And so, uh, so what is it exactly? Well, when you look at scripture and you unpack this question, you have to start 
with Genesis. And in right in Genesis 1, you have God creating the world and you have God creating the world in six days. And then on the seventh day, God rests. And then right after that, you have in Genesis 2, God actually says to Adam, he says, I'm going to give you dominion over what I've created. You, It's your job to name the animals. It's your job to take care of the gift that I've given you. And he doesn't use the word uh, domination. He doesn't use the word rule over. He uses the word, or sorry, uh, domination or mastery. He uses the word dominion because it is humanity's job to rule over the God godly gift we've been given in creation and to help take care of it. And also to, and creation serves us. Creation gives us things that we need like food and shelter and resources, but we are also supposed to kind of give back and respect what has been given to us as well. I mean, if you get a gift from someone, you're not just going to take it and throw it away or hopefully not re-gift it or destroy it, in, in, especially in front of the person and because that is very rude. Uh, and that's exactly how we're supposed to have dominion over creation. Now, we all know the story that Adam is alone and then God says, it is not good for man to be alone. And then he takes the rib out of Adam and creates Eve out of his rib. And I love that idea of taking the rib out of the side because uh, Larry Hart in the book, Truth of Flame, says it really well. He actually says that, uh, notice how Adam, and I'm paraphrasing here, but you can read it from that book or you can look up the quote online if you just look up Truth of Flame and Larry Hart. But he actually says, notice how the rib comes out of the side of Adam and God doesn't use the foot or uh, he doesn't use any other body parts to... Uh, indicate that Adam is supposed to rule over Eve. He uses the rib and he creates an equal in a different gender form. So uh, God has created this ultimate partner that is going to complement Adam, right? It's not someone he's supposed to rule over. It's not someone that he's supposed to lord over. It's this woman that meets him perfectly on the opposite end of the spectrum. And that's exactly what God created, this partnership, this union, and it wasn't good for man to be alone. Now, we look at that as a romantic thing. We might look at that as a marriage, and we might use that in marriage counseling quite a bit. But what Genesis is teaching us right at the beginning of Scripture is that God has built us to be in relationship, whether it's a romantic relationship, whether it's friendship, whether it's... Because uh, not everyone, by the way, not everyone is called to be in a marriage. So I think there are people that just won't get married one day. And I think, and we're actually the last part of our relationship talk on episode 17 or 18 is we're actually going to end our talk on relationships on being single and how we need to take care of those that are single. And that we need to create opportunities for friendship, companionship in that. So I do. So what the Bible starting with is it's teaching us that it is not good for us to be alone it is good for us to have those partners, to have that community. And right in Genesis 1 and 2, we have community. We have community between Adam and the animals, Adam and creation. And then we have relationship, and then we have a relationship between Adam and Eve, between two human beings. And then they have a relationship with the Father, with God. But then they abandon the Father, they sin, and they get cast out of the Garden of Eden, and then thus begins the story of Scripture. So uh, another point of scripture, and if you see the timeline, so the reason I'm pulling up the Old Testament when it comes to community is because the first thing people usually do is they bring up Jesus and they bring up Acts and they bring up Acts chapter two and they say, look, all the people that after the day of Pentecost happened and after the Holy Spirit fell and they were talking in tongues of fire and different languages, uh, they got together and they had communion and before they went on a mission. And that's that's not wrong. That's very true. But that idea didn't start in Acts. It actually started in Genesis. And we can see the pattern in the entirety of scripture of how community was a part of God's plan from the very beginning. Now, uh, we can see in the book of, uh, we see that Moses comes up in the book of, uh, Exodus and then Deuteronomy. And we see this story of the plagues, right? We see the story of God using these terrible plagues because Pharaoh's heart was hardened by the Lord, by the way. It says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So it was a part of God's plan to, to show his power, to show his might, 
uh, against the Egyptians with these plagues. And because of that, the Israelites were freed from bondage and from slavery under the Egyptian rule. And they were cast out and they went out in towards the promised land. And thus begins their wandering in the wilderness because of their disobedience to the Lord. Now, I think I love this part of the Bible because if in Deuteronomy, and if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Deuteronomy 5. And in Deuteronomy 5, we have the Ten Commandments. It's a very popular piece of scripture. But uh, we're actually going to look at the context of Deuteronomy 5, and we're going to go to Deuteronomy 4 first. And this is what Moses says to the people. And now, O Israel, or this is what God is saying to the people through Moses, sorry. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you. And I, and this is the ESV, by the way. And, and do them that you may live and go in and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Pur, for the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of Pur. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are all alive today. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. So he's setting the Israelites up apart from the world. You can see that Baal and Baal was a very, uh, Baal was a sexual God. He was a very, uh, uh, when people worshiped Baal, they did stuff that was very, very vile. They sacrificed their children to Baal. They would have massive orgies and worship to Baal. Uh, they would have, it was very, very, very bad what they were doing in worshiping that idol and Baal. Uh, and, what God was doing was he was purifying the people and pulling the Israelites apart from that vile worship and saying, okay, this is what the world is doing. This is what the people are doing. Now I want to exclude you from that and give you the commandments of the real Lord of not an idol of the living God. And this is what he is setting the people up to do. Cause he knows that if he gives the promised land to the Israelites, just willingly, I mean, in this part of the Bible, and especially in Exodus, there's a better version of the story. But when Moses goes up to the mountain and gets the Ten Commandments and then comes back down from the mountain, the people are worshiping the golden calf. The people, they just were rescued from Egypt. God just did this amazing miracle. They saw the Red Sea part and they were walking with Aaron, uh, who is a God follower. And... Aaron is with the people and Aaron is probably really scared. Aaron is probably with the people and he can see the people while Moses is up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments from the Lord. The people are like, oh, like we should, you know, this, we should create this thing and then it's this thing we can worship. And it's not bad intentions. They just didn't know they were creating an idol. And then, and then they must have been uh, a lot of biblical scholars, especially Jewish scholars actually say that. Uh, the people threatened Aaron and Aaron was fearing for his life, which is why he let the people do what they were going to do. And they kind of met in the middle and Aaron was like, well, if you just understand, like, you know, you can worship the, the monotheistic God that we, the God of Moses, you can, and the God of Abraham, you can worship that God through this golden calf. He kind of worded it like that. And then the people were like, yeah, let's build this golden calf. Let's build this idol and let's go and do it. That probably, Moses was probably on that mountain for probably a day or two days at most. And it, that's all it took for the people to start getting distracted and to start doing something that was ungodly. And that's why, I mean, that's why leadership is so important, but that's also the wrong side of community. There's this like almost this hive mind mentality that we can get out of community when we are, when the mob takes over and we be, we, we become a collective instead of, critical thinkers within the collective and then we don't question things because we are nervous or scared to question things even with this COVID-19 stuff uh it's funny that we're even scared to question the virus at times like you're not going to write on Facebook that oh the virus isn't as bad as everyone is saying necessarily because you might get flack for that or you, people might be like oh it's like killing people and it is killing people it's very sad and this is something we need to take seriously but this isn't as bad as the spanish flu it's not as bad as even sars when it comes to death rate right and that's what the stats are showing us right now so i mean again there's that example of the hive mind there's that example of the mob mentality and 
That is why, as a community, we need to be under the lordship of God's commandments. So, later on, this is what it says in Deuteronomy 4, verse 32. For ask now of the days that are past, which were before you, since the day that God created man on earth, and ask from one end of heaven to the other, whether such a great thing as this has ever happened or was ever heard of. Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and still live? Or has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself from the midst of another nation? To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. So the Lord is saying, I have done these things. No other God has done these things because they're not real. And so this is why you should believe in me. And this is why you should follow my commandments. And then in Deuteronomy 5, he gives the people the Ten Commandments. And this he says, this is how, as a community, you can follow me. And then we get this beginning of this amazing story of God's community failing together, succeeding together, holding each other accountable and doing these things together. And God will eventually bring them to the promised land. Uh, but it's not easy. And that's exactly why we need a community. And the first point I want to make today is we need a community because we're going to fail as individuals. So why not fail as a community and because when you fail as an individual, sometimes that's where mental health issues can creep in. That's where depression can creep in because you don't have anyone in your life. You know, if you're living totally isolated and, you, and you're and you going to mess up, we're all going to mess up. That's what we do as humans. But if you are all alone and you mess up, you might start believing certain things that aren't even true. You might become irrational. I know I fell into that camp last week. And I even, uh, when I fell into that camp, I actually went and talked to people in my life that were very close to me and they set me straight. They're like, Jordan, don't even believe that. That's not even true, right? And I think that's a great example of what community does. And so if you fail as a community, there will still be consequences, but you will be able to pick yourself up ease in an easier fashion than you would if you were all alone. Because if you're all alone, you might start believing certain things that aren't even true, if you've messed up and as a community you can bounce those things off each other and that's the first function of community is that failure is an option and as a community you can build each other up especially in your failure now we're going to fast forward because we see that in the so we have this establishment of community and an exclusive community in the israelites and that's where community starts and remember community uh you're you know, failure is an option. So failing as a community will build us up rather than failing alone. That's one, the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make today is that, uh, so God wants us to be in community. God actually made us to be in community. Uh, we can actually build each other up through our failure in community. And the second thing I want to do is we can also stay on track because of community. So Uh, the reason why God did the Ten Commandments with Moses and then Moses gave it to the people because leadership is so important when it comes to community. If you have this community and you don't have certain leaders in the community, uh, you know, I'm not saying it's always going to fail, but there is this uh, direction and vision that you get from a single leader that cares or that is on a different level than the rest of the community. Now, God didn't. God doesn't want our churches or our, our discipleship groups to necessarily look like, oh, it's the group of Jordan or the group of Brad or the group of whatever, right? Uh, he doesn't want to pick one specific pastor and be like, that is the pastor's church. It's not the pastor's church. It's still God's church, but it's the pastor's job to shepherd the church and to serve the people of the church. That's why the church pays them. So uh, I think it's very important to realize that and to understand that and it's the pastor's job to emulate what god is trying to show the people and it's also the pastor's job to steer the people in the right direction and the way we can do that effectively is actually hold each other accountable as a community and one thing a leader should always do is a leader should actually be held accountable by his community and let the community hold them accountable so the second point i want to make is very simple and that is uh, 
a community is there to build up and a, and a community there is there to stay on track. We must be in a community because then we can stay on track. And we see that in the New Testament. Now, the reason why I wanted to bring the Old and the New Testament into it this morning is was, was because in the Old Testament, you see the commandments given by God and you have God the Father, right? And in the New Testament, you have God the Son. And the reason why we have God the Son and the reason why we have God the Father is because God the Father shows us and tells us what we need to do. And then God the Son actually physically gives us a human example of what it looks like in order to do that because the Israelites never understood God. The Israelites always disobeyed God. And we see that in judges. As soon as Joshua dies, you see that in judges that judges chapter two, the people abandon God's covenant. And then you get terrible things that happen because the people are running themselves. They don't have a leader and they're not listening to God. They're not staying on track and they become a mob and a hive mind again. And they commit a terrible sin at the end of judges. Now God still redeems them through the story of Ruth or the story of first Samuel. If you're reading the Torah in the original text, and then God gives us Jesus through that Davidic line that starts there. Now with Jesus, the reason why God revealed himself as Jesus is because Jesus physically shows us what we are supposed to do. So we're not really supposed to have any more excuses as believers of Jesus and of God anymore because now God has said, well, I've literally shown you what to do and that, and you should follow what he does. In John 13, Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples and he's getting down on his hands and knees and he washes their feet. And he, and then right after that, he literally says, do as I have done, wash other people's feet, do as I do. And so that's why Jesus, the son exists. God, the father is are, or, or, I mean, if you, I mean, God is a being, so God necessarily doesn't have to be a father because God can be anything. God could be our parents. God could be our heavenly compass, right? And he has given us the rules, given us the decrees, and then Jesus has given us the way to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship and example of living for God. And that is the role of community is to keep us on track. Now, that's why we need to be in a personal relationship with Jesus on our own. And then when we come to church on a Sunday morning, or we watch a podcast like this, or we interact with any type of teaching that we get from whatever we're going to, whatever we're, whatever community we're a part of, whether it's a small group, a church, a university group, or whatever, that group should realign your thinking in the eyes of God. It should put you back on track or help you give help give you tools to stay on track, living a godly life and living for the Lord. That's the role of community. Community is not your relationship with God. You need to have your personal relationship with God first. And then your community and your Bible reading and your prayer helps infuse that relationship and helps grow that relationship, not the other way around. So we see this in the New Testament. And uh, again, I love Matthew 6. Because Jesus says in, you know, he gives the example in Matthew six, he says, you need to give to charity, but do it in secret. And then you have the Lord's prayer and this is how you pray. And then, uh, once you know how to pray, and this is the, 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 this is what he says about prayer. He says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So again, it's not about being fancy at church. It's not about doing it only in front of people. God wants us to do it in secret, to do it in our hearts and take care of ourselves away from people first. And then when we come to church, we're doing it genuinely. And when we're doing it genuinely with our community, that is so, that, that's an amazing thing. And we're going to end on the next point because uh, our the first point I made is failing through community is the best way to fail. That is the best way to build up. The second point I made is that Community helps keep us on track. And the third point I want to make is that when we're in community, we are doing God's work. God actually 
community is not just a side plan of what God wanted. Community is actually a part of God's overall plan. And when we die and we go to heaven one day, if you believe in Jesus, you will go to heaven. I do believe when Revelation talks about heaven, it talks about the new Jerusalem, the, the Garden of Eden restored. You have the city of gold in the garden that has the big wall around it. And that is what the city, that, that's what the new heaven looks like. And the new heaven and the new earth is going to look exactly like this earth, except without all the sin, without all the baggage. It's going to have us working jobs with God, and we're going to be in the full glory of God. And it's going to be exactly what God intended when he made the world in Genesis 1. And we're going to have, you know, we might not have the same relationships we had on this earth as we do in the new earth, but we're going to build new relationships in an eternal world with each other. That is a part of God's plan. And that is why community is essential. Now, again, the reason why community can get sidetracked is because of our sinful nature. And that's why at the head of all of our communities that we're in, we must be looking to the Lord as the head of them. That's it. We must have the Lord's vision in mind when it comes to all these communities. Otherwise, they will turn into... They could turn into something really ugly. That's where cults start. That's where movements start that are unhealthy. That's where things happen where people get really hurt or damaged. And then you have to hide a bunch of things in order to keep making your money or to, you know, like, there's so many factors that play into it. And that's why, you know, I love studying politics and groupthink and stuff like that. And that's the side of community we need to be really careful of. Now, how do we stop ourselves from doing that? And I brought us... I started us with the book of Acts chapter two, and I want to end the podcast today with the book of Acts chapter two, because I love what the people do in chapter two. You have chapter one, which is a direct sequel to the book of Luke. Luke wrote both Luke and Acts, and you have this language of the Holy Spirit continuing the work, right? It says, oh, Theophilus, this is the continuing work of the Holy Spirit. And it's the same spirit that was with Jesus in Luke. And then Jesus goes up into heaven, and then the people are left alone and they probably don't know what to do. Peter is probably like, what do I do? Right. And then they hold this church service. And this is what it says. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where, where they were sitting. And divided tongues as fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, uh, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. So again, you have this multitude of different kinds of people all worshiping in the same place. And then you have this day of Pentecost that happens because of this. And then the reaction from the people, you know, Peter preaches a sermon that's very hard and very convicting. He says, you, the Jews killed Jesus. Don't never forget that. And you exiled the prophets, but there is hope and redemption in Jesus. And that's why he came back to life. And these are people that actually physically saw Jesus after he came back to life. So these are people that saw this amazing miracle happen, but yet in the book of Acts, you're going to see these things happening where people are still doubting God. And I think so often we look at scripture and we say, how do these people still mess up even when, especially when they've seen these amazing miracles? And I think humans are just always bound to act like that. I think even in this crisis, this COVID-19 crisis that we are seeing, there's a lot of people, you know, I, I honestly think that, you know, I don't want to put fear into people, but I do. And we're actually going to do our next podcast episode on fear. And the question I want to pose to that episode is, can, does God use fear to do his will? And I do think that, you know, I've been reading a lot of Noah's Ark and these stories of biblical plagues happening to people because they were sinful and because they weren't following God and weren't meeting in community with God. And, you know, I do think God is using this crisis uh, in order to teach us something. God, that's how God works. And God can do whatever God wants to do. And God can also redeem any situation, right? So God can also redeem the situation. And as Christians, it's our question to say, what is our reaction to this crisis? For me, my first reaction was to put an ad out 
and to say, we are here to help you with hampers. We're here to help you with food, with supplies, and we will deliver it to you because we know this is going to cause fear in people, right? So, you know, I've never been scared of this pandemic. The only thing I'm scared of is the economy and losing my job and losing, you know, that's what I'm scared of. I'm scared of the money side of things because if we shut down the economy for any longer, it's going to make, you know, if we shut, if it's true and we are shut down till June, which I don't think it'll go that long, um, our money will start to become inflated. It will start to become worthless. So, you know, what do we do in fear of that? And now, you know, last week I was really dealing with that fear, but this week, you know, I'm not really scared anymore because I just know that, you know what, whatever happens, we're going to make sure we're okay. And we're going to make sure the people around us are okay, that we love and that we care about. And we also want to make sure that we are doing God's work in the midst of this. God doesn't want us to recoil as a community. He wants us to stay together, to still build each other up, to still hold each other accountable. And that's the last thing I want to end on is community is important because it keeps, like I said, it keeps us on track. It keeps us accountable. If you have real people in your life that are really integral to your life, that are being honest with you, and that aren't just, you know, saying yes to you all the time, those people will, it might hurt sometimes. It might feel awkward or weird when they correct you or they say, hey, maybe you shouldn't be doing that or maybe you shouldn't be doing this. But that is a necessary discipline that we need to have in our life. And the people in the book of Acts actually knew that. So you have this amazing miracle happen. And then this is what the believers do. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. And and, the, and this is Acts chapter 2 verse 42. They And they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And by, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, and they received their food with glad and with generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So again, Imagine, and this time, the Roman government was still going after Christians, and the Jewish council was still going after Christians. In Acts chapter 6, we have uh, Anna, or we have Stephen, who is going to get martyred in front of the Jewish council. There are people hunting people down who follow Jesus, and this is their reaction. They don't recoil. They actually come together, and they say, we need to sell our possessions. We need to help each other out. And we need to stay on track and we need to give to the needy because that's what Jesus did. And that's exactly what community needs to look like on a biblical sense. You know, and worship experiences are good. Experiencing things together is good. But I, we have to be careful because especially millennials, Gen Zers too, we are all, and I think actually it's not just a generational, I think boomers are in this camp too where we love experiences. And in our postmodern culture, we love to have experiences. That's why we love concerts. That's why we love worship services. That's why we love doing these things together that make us feel good. And they're not bad, but we have to also have the experiences of God. But then we also need to have the teaching and the strong intellect and the strong knowledge of God too. Because if we just have the experiences, then that will slowly fall apart, especially when we can't have them. And we live in this COVID-19 world right now, and it's probably going to last until the end of April at, at the earliest, or, or the earliest, that's what, it's going to, that's what it's looking like. It'll be to the end of April. And I think right now, and we're still going to do a worship night, we're still going to do that kind of stuff, and God uses that worship to unite us, and that is so important. But I think what this is also teaching us is that God's work can still happen even when we can't meet in person. God's work can still happen because of our knowledge, because of the word of God, because of our intellect, and because of our deeper learning of what God wants us to do. And that both are essential. You can't just have a community or you can't just have, uh, you can't ever, never experience God in a personal way and then just have the knowledge. It's just, then you get legalism and you get this unbalanced Christianity. But then if you just have the experience and the charisma and 
all these experiences that feel really good, then you're not going to have the knowledge and then you're going to have stuff go off the rails in the way of, of charismatic movements that have turned into cults that have like the lottery movement is a good example of that, that have turned into feeling good and feeling in, in selfish ways. And, and, and you get the mob mentality of the golden calf when you get that. I think the balance of two is so important. And, and for me personally, as a leader and as, and as a pastor, this COVID-19 world has really taught me that, has taught me that, you know what, maybe this is a time to kind of do the work that you need to do, but then maybe you can find things to do that are uh, that take less time to do your work so that you can take a bit of a break, that you can recoil, that you can actually kind of or, uh, retreat a little bit and you can spend more time with your family. You can spend more time with the people that you love. You can actually take this time of isolation as a blessing and you can do things that you never thought you had time to do before. And maybe after this COVID-19 world, it might teach you that you actually have time to do those things and you just need to organize a little bit or, or whatever discipline you need to learn. So that is the role of community. And so community, uh, we're going to fail. And the first point was we're going to fail. So you might as well fail as a community because then you can build each other up through your failure instead of failing alone. The second point we made was that community keeps us on track. Community keeps us on the right track under the Lord and it should. And if it's not, then maybe you need to find a different community or maybe you need to tell the people in your community that, hey, you know what? Is this really what God wants us to do? Or is this really what we're supposed to do? And the third thing, uh, and leading into that, the third thing is community is a part of God's plan. It's not just the side dish. It's not just this appetizer. It is a part of an essential part of God's plan. And the reason for that is because we need each other to keep us on track, to keep us accountable, to keep us under the Lord so that we don't go off the rails like the Israelites did with the golden calf. That's so important. And that's why the people in Acts chapter 2, they don't really go off the rails because they come together. They get the sermon by Peter that teaches them who Jesus is. And then they come to, they don't go out right away and do this like shotgun approach to ministry. They come together, they refocus, and they realign themselves with Jesus as a community. And that's so important. So I want to encourage you all with that today with the Enriched Life podcast. And I know students... Uh, right now, and and I I have some people that are watching right now that are actually that work in schools too, and I know we're all reeling from this, and, and we're gonna say a prayer blessing over you today, and I know we're all kind of trying to make sense of what's going on with the different media we're interacting with, and we're trying to make sense of what's going on, but you know what? Maybe we're not supposed to make sense of what's going on. Maybe our role in this time is to just obey the government, listen to the protocols. And just see if people need help. This is a great opportunity because when people hit crisis, that's usually when they ask for help. So this is a great opportunity to show people who God is through our action instead of just what we preach on a Sunday morning or what we do. And that is also what a community should do. And as an, at Enrich U of R, we have resources to help you. So please reach out to us. Uh, for help. And if you have any questions, please text or reach out to us as well by email or through our website in richregina.com. And we would love to help you. So we're just going to say a prayer before we end today. And if you have any questions, please post them right away so that I can address them live. And if not, we will address them on the next episode. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for everyone that tuned in live today and the people that came and went. And I pray that this podcast episode will just help us be reminded of why community is so important when it comes to the biblical stance of community. And we just thank you so much that as a whole, that the Bible teaches us that community is essential, that it keeps us on track, and that failing is an option and that a community can build us back up after our failures. And so we thank you for that. And we just give this day to you in your holy name. Amen. So thank you so much for listening to episode 16 of the Enrich Life podcast. Again, you can connect with us on Instagram at Enrich U of R. Uh, you can also uh, connect with us 
through Instagram through our Red Frogs page at redfrogs underscore Regina. You can also connect with us through our website at enrichregina.com. We're actually going to update it today. Sorry, it hasn't been updated in a while. Uh, and uh, you can get all of our next events on there. You can get our podcast times on there too. And you can kind of follow up with our podcast on the website as well. You can also look us up on Facebook at Enrich U of R. And uh, we're going to be doing this live every Friday morning at 10 a.m. And this is the, the format we're going to do moving forward. So if you have any questions or need anything, please just uh, log on and ask us, ask away and uh, have a blessed weekend. And we just thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you next week for episode 17.